Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby, where we hope to be informative and entertaining and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Listeners, we're back for episode 53 of Plastic Model Mojo. Dave, how you doing tonight? I'm I'm doing good. I'm I'm kind of thankful. As you know, we've had some rough weather in Kentucky uh, earlier in the week, and uh, I'm just thankful it wasn't near you or I, and we managed to avoid it. I'm thankful that I'm getting a little modeling done, although the dark time really has started to hit, and my my modeling has slowed down, so... Is that your model sphere update or what else you got? Going no, on? no. Uh, I've been on, honestly, I've been eyeing some things with Christmas coming up and we'll talk about that <laughs> in our special segment, but All uh, right. uh, it's, it's going well. How about you? I'll echo those sentiments. Our hearts go out to all those affected by this massive tornado or string of tornadoes or whatever exactly it was. It tore through our state and three others. Yeah. I read somewhere the biggest storm cell like that ever is that right the the, lo- the longest the single longest? continuously on the ground tornado ever recorded 227 miles we are fortunate that we were far removed from that but my gosh thanks to everyone uh out there in the uh, mojovia who has uh chimed in to ask if we we're okay we really appreciate that but uh, yes we're fine a lot of folks aren't and that's just terrible yep Yep. Uh, I've actually, the worst hit was the town of Mayfield, which yes. is the uh, county seat of Graves County. Uh, and I've actually appeared in court down there. It's a beautiful little town. It's really sad. Really sad. But on the model sphere front, uh, talking about tools, I've, I've got to know a, a, a Proxon hotwire hot wire foam cutter rather intimately over the last week. I'm going to quiz you greatly about that. Well, I I put one of those through the ringers I did, and uh, it's fun because I get to make you jealous with my work tools. Oh, Uh, I'm telling you what, those pictures you were sending me (laughs) in your workspace, that was killing me, man. Well, the last couple of weeks have been kind of tough at work, kind of in a good way, though. Um, We've been prepping all our payloads for the SpaceX 24 flight, uh, slated to launch on the 21st of December, barring no scrubs or delays. And uh, I packed... I packed out 10 24 by 16 by 16 boxes and seven Pelican cases that weren't small ones. And to secure the contents of these things, uh, I went through 35 sheets of 24 by 24 inch by two inch thick urethane foam. I had the 24 inch dimension pre-cut at the foam supplier to match the box. And I, I, I just kind of fit it after that. But uh, by the end of Sunday, I had one left and no boxes. <laughs> So, that was a lot of that was a lot of foam cutting, man. You're that, an expert. That, that was, but uh, it all worked out and it's all good. So, Proxon hot wire foam cutter. It's it's up to the task, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Mike, do you have some modeling fluid to get you through the episode? I sure do. What do you got? I'm working on four rows of small batch select. Ooh, four roses. I think that's a new appearance for four. It's, four. it's a first timer. I went today and got, uh, I got a little bit of a golden handshake at work for all the hard work over the weekend. And I sat around and work a little while and prepped the episode. And then I took off and ran an air and then ran by the uh, purveyor of libation and picked up this bottle of four roses. It's 104 proof uh, four roses blend of their own bourbon recipes. Uh, it's distilled a mere 23 miles from this chair, Dave in Lawrenceburg, <laughs> Kentucky. Yes, it is. So we'll get back to that later and see how it went. What are you sipping on, sir? Uh, I'm also uh, drinking a somewhat local brew. In my case, I'm drinking hoppy wheat, American wheat ale by West side brewing out of Cincinnati, Ohio. So I've never had it before. I got this particularly because hoppy wheat reminds me of Gumball Head. Yeah, the official beer of the show. And uh, <laughs> there's very it's there's a big similarity to it. I'll tell you on first taste, it it, it very much reminds you of that. So we'll have to we'll have to see how it uh, how it lasts through the episode. 
Well, let's get into that episode, Dave. And oh man, episode 52 topic on adhesives really picked the interest of our audience. We have a pile of listener mail and much of it has to do with adhesives. So listeners, if you took notes last episode, like some of you told me you did, going back and forth, figuring out what all we were talking about, you might want to grab a pen and a paper or hit pause and grab a pen and a paper and uh, sit back because we got a lot of listener mail. So Dave, good. Let's rock and roll. You got it. Ah, where's my glasses? <laughs> it's going to be a good thing. I think so. Uh, Jim Maddox from Arkansas, looking for suggestions on how to keep track of what steps are next and the overall plan for a model when you have multiple kits underway in various stages at the same time. You know, what do you do? Now, we answered him via email, but I don't think we've talked about this in listener mail yet. And No, uh, and it's, this is, this is a, a big problem, particularly for me. So, so what I told Jim was that, uh, keep some kind of journal and this could be as sophisticated as a dedicated, you know, a nice little leather bound book with blank pages in it to, to write down what you did last and what's next and how you think you might do it. Or it could be just some notes in the margin of the instruction sheet or something like that. But I can, it's, it's, if you got a lot going, I can see his issue. And if you're like me, you're slow and you got long spells when you don't do a whole lot. Uh, it's imperative to know what you were doing, I think. And sometimes it's not as easy as you think it would be to remember what you were doing. That's absolutely true. You know, on that M30, because I was such a gutless scoured, it sat for six months on my on my bench. And when I finally got shamed into moving forward on it again, I had to sit there and and really take some time and go, okay, what are the next three or four steps and what are what order are they as far as painting and weathering? What did I still need to do? So I sympathize with that. And I do tend, this is one of the downsides of having multiple projects is if you move back and forth between them and you're a particularly slow builder, you can be coming back to something that you haven't seen in 90 days and, and you know, it's easy to forget where you are. And the problem is that if you do a step and then realize you should have done something else first, you know, <laughs> that, that can be a project killer. It could be. And, and, and you know, on the construction side, I, up until, I don't know, since we launched this podcast and started dabbling all kinds of stuff, I've, I've been a serial builder. Let's put it that yeah. way. So I didn't have too much trouble on the construction side where I had problems was on the painting side. You would paint and you'd do some weathering and you'd use paints and products, ABC. And then you come back to it three months later and like, Oh man, what colors or what products did I use to, you know, because <laughs> if you start using X, Y, Z instead of ABC. Yeah. Then you got a problem for yourself. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. Keep some notes, keep some notes in a journal or something. Keep a build journal. Keep them. If, if you got an instruction sheet, sometimes I don't have one. <laughs> uh, I will tell you, there are several guys in our club, uh, military modelers club of Louisville, who, when they build, they actually have the instruction sheet in front of them and they have a pen and they mark through the step or mark through the part with a highlighter when they've done that item so that they know, okay, that one's already done what's the next step as far as the way the the manufacturer wants you to put it together which all, isn't always the the way you want to well i think we helped jim out a little bit and he was grateful for that advice so now all the listeners have it so take a few notes it can go yep. a long way to saving you a lot of grief uh back on the topic of licensing Chris Maddings over at uh, Sprue Cutters Union reminded us that uh, when Tamiya released that uh, Willie's Jeep kit back in uh, oh mid nineties, maybe it was, yeah, something like that. Uh, they actually had a blurb on their box that they, it was licensed by a Chrysler Corporation. Yep, and I remember that. There is an example, you know, that we could, we couldn't think of at the time that was kind of armor related, I guess, armor adjacent, soft skin Jeep. That's the point, right? Yep, it's absolutely. Not, not not just cars and aircraft. Not just cars and aircraft. Next up is Mike Spivey from Cookville, Tennessee. Your neck of the woods. Uh, no, that's in Middle Tennessee. That's like between. Well, not, it's on the no, way there. Not, not to where I'm from. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in the figure world, 
there's an economy and currency of trading figures. I often see at figure shows where one sculptor or painter will admire the work of another, and you'll often run into a trade-off or a request to trade of work. In quotes, I admire your work. Would you be willing to trade figures? This type of thing is a high form of respect. Have you ever guys have you guys ever run into this type of thing with models at, at shows or where one model will be traded for another? Uh, well, uh, very famously, Louis Pruneau traded two of his large German artillery pieces, you know, the Anzio Annie and the, I think of the Dora was the other one, for a new pickup truck. Um, <laughs> but I suspect that's not what uh, the listener's referring to. Actually, I've, I've been thinking about this within our own club. Uh, I've never seen it on like at a contest where two guys trade entries after the contest is over because they like each other's work. Although that's, you know, that, that's a, a great idea. Although different people have different levels of possessiveness over their finished work. But, you know, when we die, the odds are that most of our completed models are not going to survive us by a long because people don't have the same investment in it that we do. And uh, there are several of our club members whose work I greatly admire. And frankly, I've been toying with the idea of asking them for a minor piece of theirs to put in my case, kind of A, because I admire their work and B, because we are close friends. And, you know, it's, it's a physical attachment to them because one day they won't be around or one day I won't be around. Who knows what the fates have in store for us? It's an interesting question. I, I've never, I've never, it's never happened to me and I've never requested of anyone else, but uh, I, I can see your point, Dave. If anybody else has traded work with folks, let us know. You know, on, the guys that on the bench seems like everybody's given uh, Goldfinch stuff to put in his display case. Yeah, really? At least his compadres do anyway. Yep. <laughs> Uh, next is Andy Leffler and Andy is the communications chairman for IPMS Roscoe Turner, Indianapolis, Indiana. And it's a general announcement, Dave, April 16th, 2022 at the Boone County 4-H fairgrounds in Lebanon, Indiana, uh, will be the Roscoe Turner invitational. We definitely need to put that on the mojo calendar. That was our first contest out of COVID well, this year, I guess it's still 2021. That was our first contest out of COVID after lockdown. And those guys pulled off a really great show when there was a lot of uncertainty. And so they deserve credit. And I definitely want to get back to Indy again. Gary Sousmacat from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He's chiming in on the, uh, the adhesives, adhesive segment from the last episode. And he's talking about the, uh, I guess the touch and flow applicator. It's now from, well, it's from FlexiFile and their, right. their 10 X replacement cement. Yeah. He tried the dedicated applicator, but could just not get the feel for using it. So he returned to his tried and true method of using an old timey drafting ink nib, inking nib. And, and that's for, uh, inking drawings on a, on a, on a hand drawn scale drawing, engineering yeah. drawing. Yeah. And it uses the exact same concept, which is capillary action. Yes. And he uh, uses one and he sent me a picture of one. He's got others. So he can he's, even uses for a uh, thin CA sometimes. And the advantage he says of the nibs is you can control the amount of glue by the, the screw setting on the nib. Right. And you can change the gap on it. And if you keep the points sharpened, it can be very accurate. So th that's something I've never heard of using an inking nib for, uh, for applying model of cement. I've, I have actually heard, heard of that before, and in a previous life when I was m much younger, I spent some time as an engineering drafter, and uh, so I'm familiar with those tools, and I can see how that would work really well. But he has another tip that we might all have a little more relation to. Uh, orange juice tops. Now he's talking about the oversized ones. I, I can't remember the brand. But you know the the real the real threaded parts like a inch inch and a half, but it's got a great big two and a half three inch right. cap on it. Makes a great holder for bottles. 
round ones, round bottles. Oh, with, that's with a, 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 turned upside down. Obviously. Yeah, with with a with a few wraps of masking tape at the bottom, you can actually thread them onto the cap. So, uh, interesting tip. And he sends us a bottle of the FlexiFile, a, a picture of the FlexiFile glue bottle screwed down into one of these orange juice caps. So, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Thanks, Gary. Next, Dan Hackett from Houston, Texas. And uh, he's writing after listening to episode 52 and Dave's impersonation of, of Dave Goldfinch's <laughs> slaughtering of names. Yes, they, they mentioned this on the latest on the bench. And it's good to know that <laughs> Mr. Goldfinch and I have the same tendency. <laughs> uh, it's Jeffrey de Havilland, Dave. Y- Yes, that's uh, that. I, I've heard that now. <laughs> okay. Well, since uh, the on the bench team took care of that, I'll spare you tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Eric Simmelmayer from Pleasanton, California. Another another uh, repeat contributor to our listener mail. Uh, he says his modeling fluid tonight at the time of his email is a Woodbridge Cabernet. He says it's a cheap and terrible wine, but it's accomplishing the goal. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, hey. raise your raise your game eric yeah yeah but hey you know if it gets you there that's you know his statement or question when do you guys use standard to me extra thin and when do you use the quick set type i've tried both and i guess i see no reason using the standard type because you need to hold the parts together a lot longer than the quick set it seems like the quick set is hotter than the standard it can do the same thing that dave describes about plastic uh, the plastic weld yeah uh, would love to get your opinion on this. Well, I've never used the quick set. I actually have the quick set and I've used it a few times. It is very much the equivalent of uh plaster weld in its behavior. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't use the quick set type to me. Uh, I use the regular to me, extra thin more uh, simple. And he's right. You have to hold the parts together longer, but uh, that's not a downside for me. And it does give you a little time to adjust the fit. So that's why I like the regular extra thin better. But yes, the the extra thin quick set is very, very similar to the Flexifile Plastowell. I guess my position would be I don't want too many different types of cement on the workbench. <laughs> You know, it's like it's like going to the grocery store. He's like got eighteen thousand types of tea or whatever, right? Just why? Well, you find what works for you and stick with it. But when you first walk up, it's overwhelming, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. David Waples. Gosh, we got a lot of repeats, man. Yeah. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. But it's uh, it's like we're old friends. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, he's been using a product called Solar Res, and this is one of those UV type cure adhesives he started with one of those bondic sets that includes a little uv light but unfortunately the light doesn't last long and it's too weak to really cure the glue he didn't like that very much uh he bought a set of the uh, solar res uvs in a set of a set of them there's the three bottles a thin hard and a thick and a and a flexible option and he found the thin to be the only one really useful for his application and modeling uh, each one has a metal spout with a with a rubber cover so mm-hmm. the glue never glue never drives dries up in the metal tube because you know you need UV to cure up cure it. Right. Uh, he said the flashlight with this one is exceptional. He said it's it kind of it's kind of expensive to buy as a set, and if he's doing it again, he'd only buy the thin hard variety and the flashlight by themselves. So I've never used any of these UV cure type stuff. It's interesting. I've seen them. I've actually used them for non modeling purposes, and now I've seen guys out there apparently are using it to make lights and clear yeah parts and stuff like that um but i i haven't other than using them a few times for non-modeling purposes uh such as as putting broken christmas ornaments back together i i haven't really tried it for modeling i've not either and it's a good tip though it would make me avoid the bondix now and try this other one yeah exactly so there's my notes (laughs) yeah that's right we're making (laughs) notes too guys uh another repeat but thanks again david fuller from uh your wife's hometown there dave indian head maryland oh wow and uh his favorite plastic to plastic glue is the the fowler super expert now this hmm. is the one that's the viscosity is the same or similar to the testers right well he says tester tube glue and to me extra thin so that's 
No, that's that's a wide range. <laughs> that's that's kind of some bookends there. Yeah, uh, but it has a small metal applicator tube like the Touch and Flow, but it's a little right. bit bigger. And the, isn't this the glue all the guys in the club were using for a while? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, except I think they were using the testers version. No, it was a Fowler glue. Oh, was it a Fowler? It, yeah. Okay, it might have been. Anyway, he recommends it because you get a lot of control with one of those. He says Tom Choi turned him onto this. Mm-hmm. Well, back in college. I don't know how long ago that's been for them, but it's been a long time for me. <laughs> you and me both. And he's been using it ever since. Now, he's, he's, he's advising us for our CA glues to actually keep them in the refrigerator. I have heard that. I've heard that too, but I don't know. The rate that the, the, rate that the, the, uh, the big bottles of thin go, go thick. I don't know. I just, you know. For me, you, it's, it's just easier to buy the little small tubes and throw them away. I mean, I'd rather than invest in a, a fair size bottle and keep it in the refrigerator or a refrigerator. No, that, that is a pretty common tip. I've never really done it because it's just a, the refrigerator's upstairs. Well, in my case, the refrigerator's right next to me, but it's full of modeling fluid. So, uh, you know, I, I, I might get the, the bottle of super glue lost in there. You might. He also likes acetone to clean up his tools and applicators when he's done. And, uh, he, he just keeps a jar on the workbench and a screw top jar and soaks the tools, wipes right off. So yep. good tip there. Yeah. For cured super glue, acetone. You're right. For cured super glue, that is the way to go. Uh, he uses Gator Grip glue for canopies and loves it. Mm-hmm. He, he actually thins his down with water and he uses a long, uh, thin liner type brush to apply it. And he can get it thin enough to wick into place and, you know, not get any squeeze out. So that's a good tip. Yeah. Now uh, here, here's one that, I've not considered or even heard of is a micro scales liquid tape. Yes. I actually have a bottle of that. Well, he thinks it works great for temporarily attaching canopies for painting when you intend to do the canopy open later. Yes. I think that's a good use for that. And, uh, he also uses it to, uh, increase the tackiness of stubborn, uh, canopy mass that don't want to stick in the corners where you peel it <laughs> off the backing sheet. That that's that's a good use for that particular item, because when you pull the tape off, that uh, the liquid tape will come right with it or it's easy to remove otherwise. Michael Karnaka from Queens, New York. After hearing that episode, he wants us to try, Dave, this. Uh, well, it's the GSI Creos uh, Mr. Cement, but it's the uh, limonene type, the natural based stuff. I have I have seen pictures of those but i just haven't i've never even come across it in a hobby shop anywhere well you're going to get a bottle because uh generous mr karnaka sent us two bottles and i have them in hand now well that's very kind and it smells really good but i haven't tried it yet i'm going to wait until dave you get your bottle we're going to do a side by side doing the same type of stuff and get the same opinions on maybe maybe building like a tks or something or we can do a bench stop scientific study and not try to use it on a kit first <laughs> shot. How about that? Coward. <laughs> Michael, thank you. Very generous. And he threw in some chocolates too, but the boys got to those, Dave. So you don't need uh, that's <laughs> Hey, you, you've got two teenage boys. I understand Fe- keeping, them, keeping them full is uh, a nearly impossible task. Jim McKay from Glasgow, Scotland. All right. Oh, yeah. wow. International. That's right. Now he's got a bottle of your uh, scotch on his uh, on his bench oh. top in his photograph. I, I sh- never had that brand. Never had that oh. label. Oh, Dalwini is just the best man. I'm telling you. Oh, <laughs> I envy him. You envy him. Yes. Well, he was under the rather dumb and ignorant impression that every other modeler out there were turning out prize worthy kits every other week, while uh, <laughs> his work ethic was glacial at best. <laughs> Welcome to the club. And listening to us made us realize that wasn't the case. Tell us to keep up the good work. Well, Jim, I think uh, it's a trap, man. Yes. And you just got to stay out of the trap. And that, that, that listen, uh, the, the internet is wonderful for many, many things and has done so much for modeling. But there are downsides. And one of the downsides is that you can be left with the impression that everybody is cranking out award-winning stuff 
every couple of days or every week. And, you know, there are lots of modelers like us, and that's not the case. And, you know, you could you could start to feel bad if you get the impression that you're the only guy who's moving at a slow, deliberate pace. So don't feel bad. There are, there are many of us out there. Well, and the ones on, on the web who have time to post all that stuff are the ones who have all the time to build all that stuff. Because yes. a lot of them are doing it for a living and for other reasons in life. Maybe they have lots of time on their hands. Right. There, there, are, there are a fair number of retired guys. And, you know, uh, kids are are out of the nest, and, and so they have lots of build time, whereas people like you and I, we've got kids still in the nest. We're both working full-time plus, and so, you know, you, you got to cut yourself some slack. That's right. Got to cut yourself some slack and not, not fall into that trap because you just compare and despair. Yep. Yep. Do not compare yourself to other people. You can look at their work, you can admire it, you can try and learn from it, but don't judge yourself based on what other people are doing. Oh, next one's from our good friend Ian McCauley up in Ottawa. Uh Uh-oh. From the Ottawa contingency. He's got an adhesive recommendation. All right. Now, I use the the Aline's craft glue, the tacky glue, by by the label. He likes the jewel embellishing glue. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think I'm familiar with it. Now, this one's for gluing beads and, you know, sequins and plastic rhinestones and stuff to clothing. And he was put onto it by uh, another local club member named Kevin Brandt. And it is uh, much more viscous than white glue with a lot more grip. And it uh, really holds apart in place while you can clean off the excess. And he finds white glue is always pulling the glass away from the model if he's trying to clean up the excess. With this stuff, he doesn't. And when it dries, it's 100% clear. Hmm. I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Available at your local craft store like Michael's and Hobby Lobby. I just hope Ian's not bedazzling his jeans with it. I don't know. <laughs> and, and riding around that old car of his. That's right. Ooh, Jeff Groves, inch high guy. Oh my gosh. I haven't talked to Jeff in, in a little while. I need to I need to send him an email. He's talking to us, man. Lots of questions for PMM, and he's confident we'll have all the answers. Uh, well, he's wrong about that, but go ahead anyway. He wants to know what's the difference between a diorama and a vignette, and uh, what does the height of the trees have to do with it anyway? <laughs> well, for the first part, I will defer him to episode 26 of Plastic Model Mojo. <laughs> go listen to that again. Yes. And uh, as far as the height of the trees goes, the bigger the tree, the better job you have to do of making it or it's going to look like crap. Yes, absolutely. And he's poking a little fun at some of the more arcane IPMS category rules, which doing rules, particularly in those categories, has always been a challenge. It just like automotive is a challenge or, or uh, the newer categories, Gundam, space, sci-fi. And it's a process and it's a long process. So IPMS goes through revisions and pain and, and all in trying to get their category designations right. So if you're an IPMS USA member and you have an opinion on that subject, send it to Email the one of the officer IPMS officers. They'll pass it on to the National Contest Committee. So, you know, if you think a rule needs to be changed, widened, broadened, a new category added, one taken away, whatever, that's your opportunity. To send it to the second vice president of the IPMS. Yes, send it to the second vice president, John <laughs> Banani. Merry Christmas, John. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy it. That was our that was our housewarming gift to you. <laughs> he goes on who are these model making elites steve over at sprue pie with frets is on about are they related to the kardashians could you please <laughs> help me and tell me how to vote <laughs> well i got a vague idea who he's talking about in general and i'm not gonna go there yeah no absolutely not <laughs> a modeling reality tv show could be some very interesting television it could be and there's more uh oh. How many Arma P fifty one BCs come in a case? How many new TACOM USS Missouri turrets come in a case? <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> well, he's poking fun at me there because I suggested between he and I we ought to see if uh, Arma will quote us a case for those P fifty ones. I don't know. 
Now, I suspect that in any case, uh, Jeff would build the vast majority of them. But He probably uh, would. Yeah, I, th- I think he's uh, he has a lot of P-51 BC subjects lined up. And, you know, the way he does those batch builds, I can I can see that coming. And finally, how do you spell Sturmovic? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Not the way you spelled it, Jeff. Phonetically, that's incorrect. <laughs> Phonetically, it's Sturmovic. I, yes. think this, I think this gets confused with Sturmgeschütz. Yeah. The first letter in Sturmovic is Sha in the Cyrillic alphabet. Right, which, ha- which has no equivalent in the, in, the, in the Latin alphabet. It looks like a flat bottom W. And not the one with the little tail on it, the one without whatever that's called. I don't know, <laughs> but it's it's Sha. And yes, phonetically it is similar to the SH sound in the Western Western languages. Right. So Sturmovic. Sturmovic. So that's all from Jeff in the sprawling metropolis of Yorktown in the great seafaring state of Indiana. That's right. We got a lot of mail. We're almost done, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, well, I've got one more when you're done. Ed Barreth from California, Porter Ranch, California. Ed's, Ed's our new friend from out uh, on the West Coast. We met at Nationals with his Yellow yep. Wing aircraft. Yep. Now, this this is some good stuff for all the adhesive folks here who are taking notes. Uh, for photo etch, he's found that photo glue works very well for large, even medium flat pieces, flaps, rails, cockpit instrument, instrument panels, etc. He tapes them down and sprays a lightly uh, light application of the photo glue. It's like matting adhesive. Oh, okay. And then uh, he can place and move them over the subject. Any overspray can be removed with alcohol or mineral spirits. That's a great idea. I never thought of that. It says after he's placed them and lets them dry, he can hit the corners with super glue to seal them. The only downside is that you need to seal the sides. If you plan to use a wash with an oil based, you know, petroleum based product gotcha. after that, because it'll it'll loosen the glue. Right. But if you seal it with paint before you put the washing on, it's not a problem. Interesting idea. That is that is a real particularly for a long run of photo etch like the side skirt hangers on uh German armor, the you know, the long thin runs of photo etch that's a that's a really good idea he's got another one uh your basic glue stick he finds is uh just a little bit uh, of that on a part can uh, help place a small pe part where it's needed uh then you can hit it with super glue to fasten it any extra can be re- removed with water and it holds better than white glue or you know pva glues hmm that's another one i hadn't thought of so the old glue stick now ed's on our slate to get get on the show here in the coming year uh, yeah i've talked to him a little bit we got a couple more episodes this year, but uh, we're going to come out come out swinging in 2022 with some uh, some folks. So we got a lineup. Look look forward to talking to Ed then. Yep. Ah, Christopher Church, the Harbor Freight Super Glue is a real bargain. I need to go stock up now. Thank you for, for thank you for disclosing that secret. <laughs> hey, there are no secrets, man. I will tell you anything. Listen, that's a, one thing about modelers in general. With with some notable exceptions, modelers are the most willing to share people uh, as far as how they did something or what they use. So I, I'm glad he found that tip helpful. Chris goes on for PVA. He's his evergreen canopy glue. I didn't realize they sold a glue like this. I didn't realize they did either. He, he likes it for good. Re- he gets good results with it and likes it. Uh, and there's also Zap from Pacer uh, mm. five five sixty. Yeah, which that's said, what I have. Which he says everybody raves about, but he had never had. Uh, he hasn't had good luck with it. Mm. So he prefers the uh, Evergreen Canopy Glue over the Zap five sixty. Well, and that actually makes a good point that we probably ought to to mention. At least some of this is very individual. Two people who are mo- both modelers, both same skill level, same. One can do use one technique and it works for them, and one can use something and it doesn't work for them. I think the goal here is to experiment around and find out what works for you, and and do that. So you know, just because it works for Mike or I or one of the listeners, everything. 
the things we like to use or, or lean toward may not be what you like or what works with the way you build. So, you know, experiment. That's what I want to, you know, I want to encourage everybody go out there, you know, get the different stuff you've heard mentioned, play with it. Some of it's going to work out. Some of it isn't. But if you're lucky, you end up with a new tool in your arsenal. Well, Dave, if you got anything else, that's all I've got on, on the email front. I want to mention Mr. Frank Blanton reached out to uh, us on Facebook Messenger and wanted to remind us that IPMS Richmond in Richmond, Virginia, has a show coming up in February of 2022. And uh, the Richmond show is a fairly big East Coast show. So if you've not been and you're in the area or within driving distance, Make plans to take a look at attending uh, IPMS Richmond show in February of next year. All right. Well, that's all for listener mail. That's a lot of listener mail, man. Well, and a lot of it, a lot of good substance too. So it's, yes. worth, it's worth going through that to weed out all the other uh, tips and techniques folks are using uh, for adhesives. Folks seem pretty passionate about it. I mean, that's what we do. We glue parts together. So, yep. I learned stuff. That's listen, interacting with the, with the guys who listen. That's that's how we all learn, and I've learned some stuff just from just from those emails, and I'll be trying out a few things. So you can send your emails to plasticmodelmojo at gmail dot com. Please conclude your ge- geography. We like to know that information. Who we're getting out to, and where you where you're from. Absolutely, especially if you're from Glasgow, Scotland. True, that's great, Mike. This is the point in the podcast where I ask people if you wouldn't mind take a minute when you're done with this episode go to whatever podcasting app that you use to listen to us download us wherever you go to download us or listen to us and rate the podcast we'd appreciate if you give it five stars or whatever the highest rating is on the particular app you use if you don't subscribe please subscribe that really does help you Make sure that you don't miss an episode. It'll get pushed out automatically to you if you remember or if you subscribe. And uh, also, finally, as I've said many times, if you know another modeler who doesn't listen to podcasts, isn't listening to us, I'd appreciate it if you sing our praises, show them how to listen to a podcast turn them on to our podcast. One of the ways we get listeners, one of the most effective ways we get listeners is by recommendations from current listeners. And we've got a great group of guys here and we appreciate that. So if you would do that, it would really help us grow. In addition to our podcast, please check out uh, all the other great podcasts out there. You can do so at modelpodcast.com. It's a consortium website we've set up to give you guys all a quick link and a quick place to go find all the other podcasts out there in the scale model sphere, modelpodcast.com. All our banners are there. You can go with one click and get to a lot of other podcasts. And uh, if any of those podcasts who aren't on modelpodcast.com are out there listening, uh, send us an email. We can tell you what you need to do to get set up on there. Cause uh, there's a few out there now that have popped up or have been out there for a while that uh, are kind of, kind of on their own and it, might be beneficial if you uh, if you joined in. In addition to the podcast, we got a lot of blog and YouTube friends out there. Uh, we've already mentioned him once, or at least Jeff Groves did. Stephen <laughs> Lee, Sp- Sp- Sprue Pie with Frets. He's got a great blog. Go out there and learn about the uh, Kardashians of modelers. <laughs> Chris Wallace, modeler playmaker. He's got a blog and a really good YouTube channel. I'm always liking what Chris is doing. He just appeared yes. on the Scale Model Podcast recently as well. So yes, he check, did. Check him out there. Jeff Groves, who had the lengthy email with all the really crazy questions. In Chai Guy, all things 72nd scale. Great blog, especially if you're in the 72nd scale. Yep. And that man can build. He can build. And finally, Jim Bates of Scale Canadian TV. Please check out his YouTube channel. And he just had an appearance on uh, the Plastic Posse podcast. He did indeed. So uh, check all those guys out. It's worth your time. Yes, it is. And finally, if you're not an IPMS USA, IPMS Canada, or IPMS national member of whatever uh, uh, country you're in, please consider joining your IPMS national organization. They're a good group of people. They work a lot 
behind the scenes to promote modeling, to help modeling be more organized, keep contests from stepping on each other, try and come up with general rules, guidelines that different clubs can use to build their own contest or judging systems. It's a great organization, and I highly recommend it. So if you're not a member, please consider joining. And I do want to give a shout out to all of the MEP people who've emailed me to tell me that due to this little plug that they've joined or rejoined, thank you very much for doing so. All right, Dave, this Four Roses has totally killed my cube. So we're going to take a break here and have a word from our sponsor while I uh, ice up. You got it. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder Steenbeck airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory-grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. All right, we're back, and it's Wagon's Hoe from Omaha, Dave. Yep, uh, getting closer. At the time of this recording, we are 218 days away from the IPMS National Convention in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh man, so close to under 200. Won't be long. After Christmas, we'll be there. I know, man. I know. Can't wait. Well, I think we're good, but I fear some of this uh, Omicron reaction is going to encroach on our internationals. I I hope not. I hope not. I'm hoping by next next, uh, July we're, we're... past the the unless we see you know something develop i'm hoping that we Om- omicron has occurred early enough that we'll be past that by the time uh, uh omaha comes around omaha omicron hmm. by the time that uh, omaha comes around keep our international hopefuls in mind cuz i really want to meet those guys so. oh god yes yeah uh i did talk to scott hackney though via email and they continue to work on the pricing right now before the registration opens in February, they're finding some issues with the uh, inflation, to be honest. Uh, food and buses and stuff are a lot higher than they were in 2017, the last time they did this. Yeah. Uh, and they price the tours and the banquet at zero profit. So any cost increase is strictly inflation. Just the reality of it, but you know. Yeah. The prices will be what they be when registration starts and you can make your decision then. They're approaching 250 vendor tables sold. There's some still available. And they think, you know, COVID fears are still keeping some vendors from committing this early. That's understandable. Sure. Uh, it's just going to linger on for a while. But uh, we don't have a, a big update from Scott right now. But just uh, the big thing is registration opens on February 1st, 2022. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. I'm going to register right when it, right when they open. All right, Dave. It's Benchtop Halftime Report, which is brought to us by Tackett Z. Tackett Z, the must-have tool for the model maker. You can visit TackettZ.com. And check out all their modeling tools, which I've got a few of and I'm really enjoying. Yes. And until January 15th, you can enter the discount code of PMM at, the, at your checkout at TackettZ.com and get 20% off your entire order. So there's an incentive to go shopping for yourself. Absolutely. Treat yourself to a little Christmas cheer. That's right. At least get the alligator clip, man. The little ones, man. I yes. use those, those. Those have become a staple on my workbench in yeah. like eight minutes. Yeah. You're like can't live without them. Yep, you and me both. And he's got better stuff than that. That's just yes. If you want to start small, start there. Well, Dave, what's halftime looking like on your bench? My bench top is looking good. Uh, the things have slowed down a little bit. Just simply, you know, this is the dark time between Thanksgiving and New Year's, and usually I don't get much done. I've actually continued to model, but again, it is slowing down just because of the obligations of. Uh, family and Christmas and all of that stuff. Uh, the mosquito is almost ready for. Uh, it's been pin washed. It's uh, uh, ready for a, a satin coat or semi matte coat, and then just sticking on the do's and dads. I, I still have an outside hope of finishing it before the end of the year. The M30 is sitting on the bench, but I'm slightly on hold on it because I I painted up that KV turret to practice my chipping on, and I'm actually going to try and do that when I'm not working on the working on the mosquito. But I have 
I I have committed a, a little bit of a sin in that I have started a new kit. Um, worse yet, it's not 72nd scale. Uh, it's actually being built as a Christmas present, but it won't be done by Christmas for sure. But uh, uh, I'll probably... I'll probably drop a hint or two on the Facebook page and let people see if they can figure out what I'm working on. But overall, slow progress, but progress. How about you? Well, that's not very much. I know. I know. I just said slow down. I did. did. Everything? No, nothing on the uh, big interceptor you're building? No, the, the TU-128 is actually on hold while I try and get... my My desktop has too much stuff on it. And I need to get some projects off of it so that I can actually make regular progress again. Like the mosquito. Like the mosquito. The mosquito is 90% done. I just need to to get it over the line. So I really need to focus on that, but I'm I'm not doing a great job focusing. What what's your bench top look like? Well, it's slow as well, so I can't chide you too much. Sure you can. I've been playing around with some 3D printed M3, M4 tracks. Now, you you don't have a, a 3D printer, but you have access to one at work. I have access to one at work and have been told to print my model parts to learn how to use them. So here we go. And you didn't design <laughs> these parts, correct? No, I did not. I, I got uh, these from uh, BJ DeBecker from Panzer Concepts. He had shared these uh, files in the Plastic Posse podcast M3, M4 group build, which I'm part of. And uh, he's got all the Sherman tracks basically in this file. And uh, I've got the I've got the print files specifically for my, well, they were done in the software that is resident to the printer I'm using. It's a, a, form, a form three from Form Labs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've printed some test prints. I didn't get great results. They look great, but uh, there's some issues I'm having with them. And plus, I have to I have to size them up to 32nd scale. Believe it or not. Yeah, that that's unusual. I'm 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 wondering why you might need to do that. Well, because I've kind of decided my next uh, nostalgia build is going to be a 32nd scale M3 Lee from Airfix. Now, where did you come across one of those? Uh ebay out of the uk now the grant's not too hard to find right now these are the old kits 30 second scale these aren't right. the new ones they offer from uh, academy academy these right. are the old 30 second scale molds so the grant has been available on and off since its release in 76 i think the lee the american version has not they and they did they did a run of it and then it never is never surfaced again. I wonder if that indicates something happened to the mold. Uh, the turret mold alone, I guess, because that's the only thing that's different. Right, right. But I, I you you kind of wonder if they released it in the seventies, you would have thought that they they'd have repopped it at some point, even if it wasn't the world's greatest seller. You're right. I, I think you're you're right now. The reason I, I'm wanting these tracks is because the M3 Lee kit comes with the the waffle type tracks, which were more, well, I don't think they're ever seen on an American M3. They're certainly seen on the Grants. And I think, you know, because it's Airfix, a UK-based company, they put the right tracks on that version of the vehicle. And they just changed the turret of that kit to make the American version, which has the wrong tracks at that point. Right. So... Kind of playing around. I've I've got I found a kit at a builder's price out of the UK. I, I've I've bought it, so the box isn't collectible grade, but that's not the point. Yeah, no. If you're going to build it, you don't care what it's in, yeah, what box care. it's in. For some reason, the kit went out of production. Something possibly happened to the turret molds. That's all speculation. But regardless, the kit was kitted with the wrong tracks. So I'm playing around with these 3D printed tracks. To, that's really the only way to get a, a set of 30 second scale tracks that are accurate in the right scale because the monogram ones aren't accurate either. Sure. Uh, sure. They, they put the, they put the in connectors at the ends of the pads instead of between the ends of the pads. 
on the, mon- <laughs> on, the on the monogram kit. So it's a Oops. subtle it's it's a subtle thing, but if you know it's there, you can't unsee it, right? See it, yeah, I know what that's like. If there's anybody listening with uh, Airfix or Hornby and knows why the Lee was never repopped or re-put out, uh, we'd love to know. So reach out and tell us. Well, in addition to the the tracks I've been playing with. Uh, I've been working on some uh, rifle slings in 35th scale. Now, are you doing those with like 5,000th uh, plastic sheet or photo etch or what? Well, you know, to back up a little bit, these are for the uh, a couple of Mosin Nagant rifles that are going to be used on my vignette base with the other discarded gear for the Zis, the Zis 2 vignette I'm but working on. Is, is it a vignette or a diorama? Uh. <laughs> We'll have to ask Jeff. That that woman's for you, Jeff. But it doesn't have a tree, so I don't know. Yeah, that's right. I am using 5,000 styrene and photo etch buckles from a generic buckle set from Aber. Okay. Uh, you know, it looks doable. I don't know how robust it's going to be, but I, I can glue them onto the rifles with liquid cement. I think that's a, a that's a plus. Yeah. Now, but, who's, who's most of the gaunts are you using? Uh, they're the ones from... Uh, Dragon. No, no, no. They're for mini art. Okay. I got a, a mini art set recently. We'll get to that in the next segment, but uh, uh, they're really nice. Uh, actually, I, I have some PE buckles from, uh, or PE slings from Dragon, one of their Gen 2 figure sets, but there's no instructions on how to put them together. Uh, it's not real clear which slings go to which weapons. Wait a minute, Dra- Dragon putting out instructions that are less than full and complete? I've never heard of such a thing. Well, it's worse than that. There's a uh, a Degtiarev DT-28 machine gun. Is that the one with the round magazine on the top? Yes, and there's okay. most of them got rifles and uh, PPSH-41 submachine guns. And, you know, even with my knowledge on the subject it's not clear which slings go to which weapons in that set because they're kind of they're ish let's just say yeah. that <laughs> they're ish <laughs> so i'm gonna forge ahead but uh, really uh it's been a slow week due to work slow couple of weeks but uh that's what i've been working on not yeah. z- not zero but not uh not north of 50 percent progress either on anything now uh, I take it, and and here's where we learn a little bit more about World War II Russian equipment. Were the slings used on the most of the Nagants leather, or were they cl- some to- some type of canvas or cloth? Uh, the pre-war ones were leather. The early war, wartime ones, and you know from that point on were were mostly canvas, a heavy uh, webbing with uh, gotcha. The Nagant sling was kind of unique. It had, uh, the collectors call them dog collars. There were little leather straps on the end of the of the web strap mm-hmm. that had their own buckles on them that went through slots in the rifle. And that's how it was held on. It's a really robust and really easy way to mount a sling on a rifle. But uh, so, so it wasn't like uh, a hook at the end that went through an eyelet or something that was, or that was, screwed into the rifle it actually went through a slot in the rifle yes there was a slot up on the foregrip and one the butt stock that the, this, this little leather strap this dog collar went through that and then buckled through the ends of the the web strap that's what gotcha. held, that's what held it on the rifle so uh it's really easy to do with plastic uh, if just you know it's, it's really fiddly it's small it's fragile are you going to do leather or canvas or a mix? Oh, and- they'll, be, they'll be canvas. It, le- the leather ones are really, really rare. That would, that would almost be anomalous, really. And I assume it's some sort of generic green color. Yeah, it's faded khaki or green, something like that. Gotcha. Are there gonna are there gonna be any other? Have you figured out what else is going to be laying around? Mm, no, not yet. Still working on it. One thing at a time, man. Uh, I hear you. Hey, you got the ammo boxes done. I did. I'll get this done too. What else? What else, man? I think that's it for me. I don't have. Is that it for you? That's it for me. Well, you're making a little progress. Making a little progress. That's right. But it's not just building; it's buying. So, uh, Mike, uh, what broke your wallet this last month? 
Oh man, Dave, it's a bloodbath. Uh oh. Uh oh. Like like a Sam Peckinpah movie, bloodbath. <laughs> <laughs> Despite our lack of attention, uh, my little military side hustle is, remains moving forward just because there's a website out there. Uh, and I've sold a couple of things that I was sole, sole investor in, I guess. So mm-hmm. I've got, I got a little blow money over the last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he doesn't mean that the way it sounds for all the DEA agents listening right. and uh, blow it. I did. First thing was I bought six different sets from Fine Molds from their Nano Aviation line. And, and, and I am super jealous. And just various seatbelt sets and machine gun sets in 72nd scale. I got like American seatbelts. I got Japanese seatbelts. I got German seatbelts. I got uh, Japanese machine guns and German machine guns. Now they make these in three scales. Yeah, and I I am super jealous of you on these. I did not know these existed until you ended up purchasing. So, you know, they are really nicely detailed. And you get like four sprues of each in in a set. They're not they're not outright. I can't remember what I paid for them, but they're they're not terrible, but they're not they're not well, giving they're fine molds. They're, they're not going to be cheap. They're not giving them away either, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, they're really finely molded, hence the name, but it's going to be a little bit of a challenge because they're molded in ABS instead of straight polystyrene. I'll be interested to see how they handle paint and glue and all of that. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but it's not insurmountable because, uh, I don't use it much because Evergreen has come out with all the same stuff and, and pure styrene, but for ages and ages, Plastruct was kind of the only supplier in North right. America of, of dimensional shapes and, you know, architectural shapes, I beams, C channels, that sort of thing. And, and their right. stuff, their stuff was all ABS. Yeah. And they sold their own cement, but you know, it could still give you a little bit of fits to work with. Uh, we'll see how this goes. So I don't know what project these are going to get thrown into. I imagine there might be a 72nd scale Arado AR196 on the horizon. That would I, that I would, cannot wait to see that. That could involve at least two of these sets. So, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> so what else that come to what else was the bloodletting? Uh out of the Ukraine from Redbox, I bought a set of Imperial Japanese pilots and ground crew in 72nd scale. Now, I have those. These are, you know, the kind of polyethylene molded soft plastic type figures, but there's some good poses in there. I'm going to put with the E16 on the catapult. That I think will kind of set the scale of the aircraft and how big it was compared to a person, etc. Yeah. Uh, and in that sink kind of in that kind of use where you're not handling them after they're painted, they'll be fine. Yes. Absolutely. And and there are some tricks to those things, too. There, there are. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But that's not all. Uh-oh. I was in Louisville last week at a swim meet with my son, and we cruised by Brian's, and I bought a set of uh, Soviet infantry equipment from MiniArt because I had a, had a discount reward on my uh, customer loyalty dealio. Yes, you got a deal deal. I got a deal deal. So I bought those at Brian's Scale Reproductions in Louisville. Great shop. And that's where my rifles are coming from for this uh, vignette. Maybe a few other things too. We'll see. Well, good. I'm I'm interested to interested to see those. I love those mini art sets. I actually got the uh Civil War set and one other set. So I they they do some nice stuff. Ah, from Hong Kong, I picked up a uh, model collects Fortress Ostrot. Oh, he got the turret. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Don't have it yet. <laughs> now, Fortress Ostrot in Norway. Yeah, it's in Norway. Uh, was one of the turrets from the Gneisenau, mm-hmm. which was sister ship to the Scharnhorst, which had a catapult on the aft turret until like 1940. Yeah. So you see where this is going. Yeah. When that when that arrives, we'll flesh that out and see how that see, see what that looks like. But uh, I got my big turret for my catapult turret Arado one ninety six kind of kind of build there. 
I get the feeling that maybe uh, Mr. Groves is going to probably have some more input for you. I'm sure he will. <laughs> <laughs> Though I think I've got everything I need because I've got that. Uh, yeah, I've got the anatomy of shit book on the Sharn horse. So I'm in pretty good shape. Yeah. Yeah. And from an obscure French company called AJP Maquettes, I have a catapult Penvit 3.5 ton naval catapult. Oh, you bought scale. that. I bought it. Man, I'm I'm glad you got, got that and were able to get it, frankly. Well, I don't have it yet, but... Uh, well, you bought it, so it's coming. But because uh, I, I was afraid that one was going to just disappear. No, it's available. I've been talking to the guy via email. My my friend in France helped me set up an I-band transfer to pay that guy really quickly. Uh, not only to get a catapult, I got a PE set for the Azure Loire 130. That is an ugly airplane. It's kind of attractive in an ugly kind of way. <laughs> I know. I know. I know exactly what you're saying. I, I think it's all the silver doped uh, canvas, probably. It's just kind, yeah. of, kind of a neat construction. So I got that coming. Uh, I was in need of a new rotary tool in the workshop, man. Oh, this is the big one, right? This, this is the big this, expense. It's probably the big one. Uh, I bought a Wells dental engine. So you, sh I think you put a picture on the Facebook page, didn't you? I did. And I've been looking for one of these for like two years. Because I'm not sure many people know what this actually is. It's uh, a a dentist tool. It's a dentist tool. It's a rotary handpiece. It's belt driven electric motor. Uh, it's got this big articulated pulley system. If you go watch Paul Buzik's video on rotary tools, he's a dentist. Uh, you'll understand. Uh, my dad was a dentist, so there's a connection there. I was kind of familiar with this before Paul Budzik, but uh, everything he said about it is true. It takes up a lot of space, but it's well balanced. It's not it's not as loud as a Dremel. It's more robust than a Dremel. I hate new Dremels because I think the bearings in them are crap, and they go out and make the thing vibrate after just a very short use, usage. I think. Uh, I'm I've got this thing. I mean, it worked. I bought off eBay. I put it, the guy had a price. He had to make an offer. I made an offer. He took my price. So maybe I, I maybe my price was still too high, but, uh, it's got a plastic model Mojo decal on it now. I saw that. I, that, I was so, so proud of you for branding it immediately. It's, you know, it's got some warts on it. It's got some flaking the nickel plating, but the belt's brand new. The hand piece yeah. is in good shape. Now, if you go down this route, uh, one caveat, it has a, th a three eighths, shank on the on the burrs so your dremel burrs aren't going to fit in this thing right so uh you're gonna get online but there's plenty there's plenty of three eighths, now, three -eighths now, how did you happen to find this on ebay do you have uh an alert uh no i have alert on some things i look for all the time but this wasn't one of them i just every once in a while i'd search wells dental engine and some stuff would come up and it'd be too expensive and i'd move on um this this tool now, Wells is still in business. And they sell an equivalent model now. It's fourteen hundred dollars. I didn't pay anywhere near that. I'm I'm well under the heartburn threshold for me. Well, and and given the fact that what you're going to use it for is not everyday dental work, I would think that that you know a use even a well used one is going to be fine for your purposes. Oh yeah, it's going to be great. I've already been messing around with it and got it all set up like I want. I got it run in, got all the lubricant redistributed in the bearings, and it's it's run like a top. All right. Well, I can't wait to see you actually uh, actually use this and maybe give us a little demo on it. But the blood bath's not over. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> well, we've already hinted at the M3 Lee, so I bought an M3 Lee, which is much rarer than the grant boxing and 30, 30 second scale from Airfix. Finally found one in a crappy box that's still got the kit, the parts in the bag. So here we go. Yeah. Nostalgia number two. And if you ask me, that's an attractive tank. I've always thought it was too bad. The box is bashed. It's attractive box art too, but that's all early. Well, you can download the box yeah. art and print it all day long. And finally from a uh, Wanamaker hobby up in Indiana. From uh, a resin out of Russia, I got a KV eighty five turret. Oh yeah, I saw saw that. Now it's actually built as an IS eighty five turret, 
which was became the IS one. It's the right. same. It's the same turret, more or less. Well, you've had an interest in that vehicle for a long time. Yeah. So uh, this one's back on the table. I think this one. And the K- the KV eighty five never got produced as a KV eighty five. Did the IS one ever get produced? No, the, the KV eighty five got produced. They oh, built, did it? They built. I want to say it's under two hundred. So, oh, okay. So, so not many. Yeah, not in the scheme of things from Russia. No. Well, Dave, to to bring that back into uh, even keel, you had to buy absolutely nothing or give a bunch of crap away. I, I well, I didn't do that, but I did. I did, since you stimulated the economy so thoroughly, you were probably a, uh, the result, you were probably the cause of all the inflation in the economy. So I felt the need to pull back. So I've made some very small purchases in the last month. I bought a filter mask, you know, one of the ones with the canisters on it. Yeah. Uh, I bought one, uh, even though I have a spray booth, an air booth that I use when I'm uh, 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 airbrushing. Uh, And in my younger years, I've probably been a little too cavalier about not being as, as, as safety conscious as I should given, especially given that lacquers and enamels are what I like to spray. Uh, So I finally caved in and, and gotten that. But I also got it because I'm picking up leaves out in my yard and grinding them up. And man, those that leaf dust gets in your sinuses. It's just unbelievable. So it will have a non-modeling use for when I'm working in the yard. Um, I bought on your recommendation the some Citadel paints. I went to the local Warhammer store here in Louisville and uh, picked up some null oil and a couple of other paints uh, to use. The all metallics? No, uh, I've already had a couple of metallics. I picked up a brown. I picked up a what they call technical storm shield, but what it actually is is a flattening agent because the null oil I got is the null oil gloss. Oh, okay. And, and so if you mix the technical storm shield into it, It'll flatten it out. I purchased on the recommendation of several club members a bottle of the MIG Ultra Glue. I'm going to test it out and see how different it is from Formula 560 or glue and glaze or that those type of things, uh, just to see. And I bought an Osprey book. Osprey has uh, done a... Uh, book on the Ploeshti raid, and I'm a sucker for that particular event in World War II history, so I uh, ordered that book, which is on the way, but not yet here. So unlike uh, unlike you, I I, I kind of pulled it back. I you know my kids are going to get Christmas presents, unlike yours, who apparently are not going to get anything but chocolates that one of our our listeners sent. <laughs> Well, it's not that bad. <laughs> oh man. Well, is that it for you, man? That's that's all I bought. I well, I, I was restrained. Hopefully, get, hopefully you get something for Christmas. Well, we're going to talk about what what may be coming under the Christmas tree. We are. It's our special segment, Dave, and it is entitled Tool Envy. And I think first, let's back up a little bit and talk about stuff we've purchased since we launched this podcast. Absolutely, because there are several things that I had Tool Envy on that I went ahead and pulled the trigger on. And and uh, I've got to say, in each case, I'm actually very happy with it. Well, give me one of them. Well, uh, first and foremost, and shout out to our friend, Dr. Uh, Strangebrush, I have wanted for a number of years a Harder and Steenbeck airbrush, uh, especially after attending several IPMS nationals and watching John Miller work with it. You know, it's significantly more expensive than a harder and Steenbeck infinity is, ex- is substantially more f- expensive than most airbrushes out there on the market. And, and there was some hesitation in spending that money, especially when I had several airbrushes already, but I will tell you, I was 
I, I pulled the trigger on it about two, two and a half years ago, right about the time we were starting this podcast. And I've got to say that it absolutely lives up to all the hype. Uh, I can do things with that airbrush that I cannot do with any other of the four airbrushes that I own or have owned. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And it was well worth the money. It wasn't cheap, but it wasn't in the scheme of things, especially given some kit prices these days. Uh, you know, it was, it was well worth the money and I'm happy with it. How about you? Since this podcast started, I've also picked up a harder and steam back infinity. Haven't used it a whole lot yet, but, uh, hopefully it's going to change over the Christmas holidays, but did, did not do the same thing. I, I, that thinner line circle cutter. Uh-huh. I, you know, I picked one of those up, took a while to get it. Cause that's right. In the, like in the middle of the COVID the pandemic. Yeah. Down, me too. And it took forever, but you know, yeah, I didn't have one before. So waiting to get one that I never had is not any big deal in my opinion. And it finally showed up and I used it on the Zist to mask the wheels and a couple of things. And well, I used it on the, uh, my little air fix nostalgia build too. So right. really like it. Highly recommend it. I don't know about the others. There's a couple others out there. I don't know much about them, but uh, the thinner line was a good product. And I even did a little engineering, re, you know, reverse engineering on it and figured out how to uh, create a little formula to calculate the, uh, the diameter of the circle you want, circle you want to cut without, without having to use that graduated sticker they give you to put on the side of the thing. Yep, absolutely. And I keep go uh, I keep contacting you every time I use mine to get the <laughs> formula again. But uh, I will I will second your praise of it. The the thinner line is a really nice product and you're not going to use it every day, but when you have a need for it, that is the tool you need and so it's great to have it and and boy it is. I don't know about some of the competitor products out there, but the thinner line is really, really well engineered. Very solid piece of equipment, and and I'm super pleased with mine. And I did the same thing. I've used it several times to create masks. Well, it's nice to have a tool of that quality to just you know. Oh, I need to cut a circle and not even yeah. think think twice about it. Exactly. Well, I have to think twice because I have to text you and say, Mike, what was that formula again? But mm -hmm. other than that. And remember where you put it. And remember, well, I know actually it sits, it sits out on my desk. It actually is one of those tools that sits out on my desk. You got any more you bought since this podcast started? Yes. The other one I bought was the R&P chopper. It's basically the upgraded equivalent of a I forget what the product's called that you've got, the uh, Chopper 2 or whatever. Right. But except this is made out of all anodized aluminum. Very precise, very well engineered. Uh, wasn't cheap, but uh, but well worth it. And then I ended up using it uh, on the TU-128 project on the missiles. And it was really nice to be able to cut uniform pieces of styrene so that I could do the reinforcing plates on the missiles. Do you have another one that you've purchased? You know, I bought Goodman Super Sanding Blocks, and I like those things a lot. You know, I forgot all about those. I should have. I should have added that to my list. I love those things. I was very skeptical that uh, that those were going to be a useful item. In fact, uh, Jim Bates will tell you that I talked him out of buying them at the nationals in chattanooga i don't remember that but he says i did but boy i'll tell you what they really did turn out to be great well i use them a lot uh i need to replace a couple of them but uh you know it's a simple thing you know you could probably make make those yourself i guess but uh i, I didn't have to it's worth it to buy them and absolutely they're not that expensive and they are very high quality I don't have to, I mean, I haven't used mine enough to, to yet to be to the point where I need to replace one, but, uh, they're, they are a really great product. And again, another one that sits out on my bench, it's a tool that I don't have to go looking for. Well, that's the stuff we bought since then. 
What's what's on our wish list, Dave? What do you hope? Well, for? I've actually got one more that I have bought, although it's almost like a wish list item because I bought it, but I haven't used it. And uh, uh, the guys over at the PPP are to blame for this because at the at the nationals, it was either John Bonani or TJ. I think it was TJ had one of these DJI OM4 gimbals for your cell phone. Is where John. you can was it John? Okay, then it's John's fault. Sorry, TJ. That you can use, you can mount your phone to it, and then you can use it. It does multiple things. You can use it. Uh, the handle spreads out into a tripod, so you can use it to film uh, work that you're doing on your workbench. Uh, it's got tracking software that, as you move, it will actually follow you. Uh, then you can fold up the tripod into a handle and then carry it around with you so you can use it like a steady cam operator uh on a film set would use to film uh you know either the models on the table or walking around the vendor room you can flip it around and it will follow you as you record um it's just neat uh, now i haven't gotten to play i bought it but i haven't played with it yet and so it's something that I do want to play with, but uh, I'm blaming John Bonani for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the stuff we bought since we've launched the podcast. I'm sure you have a wish list, Dave. So what, what you I get, do. What's got your eye on? What's your first one? Oh, the, well, if they keep going, and that's the problem here is they keep jumping back and forth. There are several things I I'm interested in acquiring, and what sparks my interest, keeps moving back and forth. I will tell you the current leader in the clubhouse or uh, the current leader so far is the uh, Proxon Hotwire. A, a well-toned YouTube modeler has been using one lately to uh, do some architectural modeling. And uh I'm a lawyer by trade, but if I had not become a lawyer, the other thing I would have done would have been become an architect. So when I see what you can do with this XPS foam using these hot wires to make uh, diorama pieces, uh, uh, buildings, cobblestones, sidewalks, stuff like that, that, that really that really is hitting me in a spot that I'm very, very interested in. So it's the current leader in the clubhouse as far as uh, possibly my next big tool purchase. Uh, and the fact that you've been using one just makes it all the, <laughs> makes it all the worse. Well, it's a good tool, man. I, I like it. It's uh, it's a little small for what I'm trying to do. Right. At, at work, not, not modeling, but at work. Right. Um, I've got some big foam I got to cut and it's right. just, just that sometimes the fence won't move out far enough without falling off the work surface. It's just not big enough. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But it's up to the task. Trust me. Well, and, and now I'm the other thing I'm trying to figure out is if I get it or when I get it, where the heck I'm in the model room. Am I going to put it? It's, so. it's not, it's not that big. I know it isn't, but still, I've got to do some planning. Well, I want a vacuum form machine, Dave. Oh, oh, damn! That's one that I didn't even put on the list. I meant to. You, you're you talking one of those uh, uh, blue base? Uh, they're basically knockoffs of the of the dental vacuum forms. Yeah, I mean they're they're Chinese marketed. Well, they're, they're Chinese made and marketed in the U S dental vacuform machines. Now back to Paul Budzik, he's got a video on vacuum forming. He's, he's using one of these dental vacuum formers. My dad had one that I used to make model parts on at his office. In fact, the rear fenders on my, that T 55 I rebuilt from uh Lindbergh. Yep. has got fenders made on it from, from his vacuum form machine. And it's small. It's like four by four inches, platen on it to make small stuff. But uh, you know, the 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 exact version my dad had in his dental office is like a four hundred dollar piece of equipment used, right? And these things are like a hundred and thirty bucks. 
Yep. And there's a couple of videos out there and they're pretty damn good. Yep. I'm, I am super interested in those things though. They look, I mean, they seem like they would be very, very useful. If nothing else, popping out canopies. Oh yeah. Uh, for an aircraft modeler. And that plate in a four by four or so four 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 and a half by four and a half is more than big enough to do most of the things that I think in 72nd scale I would want to do. Yeah. Adam Savage has one of the videos out there on this thing. Yep. And I need to go watch the Budzig video. So, you know, the, the thing that came to mind that made me want to get one and try it is the, this Reba Botan thing I keep flirting with. We'll see if it ever goes anywhere at this point, but uh, the front fenders, Mm -hmm. it's a perfect candidate. Yep. I, I mean, you could 3D print them too, I guess. But uh, if you vacuum form them in styrene, then you you kind of take care of one of the, the the glue issue, right? Right. Well, not only that, but they're they're going to be super thin. And if you were inclined to dent up one of the fenders, it's much easier to dent up thin styrene. It is. You're right. Yeah. What's that? What else is on your list? Well, uh, uh, the thing that used to be number one on my list, but now is probably sitting number two, is a stencil cutter. You know, either a Cricut cutter or there are numerous different types of these things that basically are, they they originally were came out in the uh, scrap, for use in the scrapbooking world. But modelers being ever innovative quickly figured out that you could... Um, use them to cut stencil masks for markings for uh, models, particularly aircraft models. But, you know, you're not limited to that. And I can see some uses for them. And uh, that, until I started uh, looking at the Proxen thing, the number one thing that I had been thinking about was the stencil cutter. Maybe you should buy one of these and I should buy the other one. There you go. We yeah, we need to work at some sort of some sort of deal. Uh, you know, another one that's caught my attention, and and this one comes to mind for me from from multiple angles. There's now, and it's it's kind of being marketed to the American dental market again. But there is a a really small, I mean, really small lab type blasting cabinet for grit blasting. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. I mean. Typically, things that these are big cabinets. They they got the glove hands, you know. Right. Well, this still has the gloves, and it's it's got the blasting needle and all the air connections. But the workspace is only like maybe eighteen inches square. So this whole thing is not very big at all. What do you think it should be useful for? Well, for one, is this old school fantasy miniatures rabbit hole I've gone down, where you get these things off eBay, and they've got like four layers of 30 year old paint on them and the, uh, the solvent dip just won't quite cut it. You know, gotcha. <clears throat> this will take care of it. Cause I've got a badger air eraser and I go outside and do that. Yeah. But even outside, Oh my God, it's, it's a mess. Absolute yeah. mess. I mean, this crap gets everywhere. Uh, and then also have been known to use that air eraser to etch photo etch sheets to get better glue and paint adhesion to them. Gotcha. Because chipping photo etch or not having it glue good because it's too smooth and it's brass and you know, you know the drill, right? Yeah. Um, it, I think it helps a lot. Now my experience is, is light, but uh, especially on the paint side, I think it, I think it helps a lot. Yeah. I can see how giving it a, 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 a just a very light etch to give, give it a tooth that the paint can hang on to makes a lot of sense. Got any more? I've got one more, but uh, I'll be honest with you. This one has moved way down my list since a very close friend of me of mine got a job that means that I don't have to buy this expensive piece of equipment and know how learn how to use it. When I have a use for it, I can just contact him and he can use one of the many 3D printers that he has at work <laughs> to assist me in whatever project I'm working on. Um, I, 
I will tell you, I, I, I toyed with the idea of a 3D printer. Uh, lots of guys are doing it. Uh, Mr. Tackett's has done a, a wonderful job making a lot of hobby assist tools with it. Uh, I can see it becoming more and more useful for uh, modeling purposes. So that was something I was considering. But given that other items have moved up my list and given that uh, you now have access to some pretty sophisticated equipment, uh, that one probably is moving a little bit down my list. <laughs> well, that's kind of my last one, too. And you, you think, well, if you can use one at work, why would you want one of your own? <laughs> uh, it's a fair question. I think, you know, I, I never know what resin is going to be in the tank at the one at work based on folks printing. Right. And, uh, you know, it's a great printer. It's a Form Labs Form 3. But uh, the resin selection we have at work is is more geared to what they're doing. Yeah. There's like like a biomedical compatible clear resin they're using. Uh, and then the standard form labs clear, which I don't think is ideal for model parts. And we've got, we do have the gray tough resin. Uh, mm -hmm. I need to give it a try next time it's in the vat, but the, typically I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go change that to run model parts on at work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, going to just kind of catch it idle with the right resin in it and go from there. Right. Just makes more We're sense. But you know, I've, I've looked at, I don't have a I don't have a model or brand picked out yet, but I'm following a couple of people online out in the model sphere who are doing a lot of 3D printing and looking at what they're using and doing some price comparisons and stuff. Yeah. So it's on my radar. Okay. Well, that's good. Then when you buy one at home, I can or, and get one at home, I can have you print those parts for me without having to wait for one of the ones at work to free up. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> And we will have to say that Mike's employer actually encourages him to do this in order to get get more used to the to the equipment and and learn the equipment. So uh, it's not like your your employer doesn't realize what you're doing. And that's true, but you know, st even still, my use has been really incidental. I've like used sure. it maybe two times since I've been there for eight months. Sure, so sure. We'll see. We'll yep. see what happens. Got any more? No, I think that's uh, as far as tools. I, I think that's probably. Uh, yeah, I can't think of another one. Do you have another one? I don't, but our listeners might have some more. So, yes, listeners, how about uh, you've got a tool on your wish list? Tell us what it is and why. What you think you're going to use it for? Absolutely, I want to hear this. So, I want uh, you know, I'm always up for a new tool. You can never have too many tools. I agree. Completely. I don't care how specialized they are. Yeah. All, it's always great to have that one tool when you need it. Exactly. It, that's that point of that thinner line circle cutter. You know, you're not cutting circles every day, but the time you need to do it, you've got the right tool for the job. Mike, uh, have you uh, finished up uh, your four roses? It's about finished up me. <laughs> Well, you made it through. It got you through the episode, and you got it through the episode. What'd you think? Uh, it's pretty sweet on the front end. There's a lot of oaky notes in the front end. It's guy. Yeah, it's hot. It's hot on the back end. Yeah. Well, 104 is hot. Well, but you know that uh, that old Forester 1920 is about the same. It's it's not this hot. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's good. Will it displace one of my others? Mm, I don't know. How was the price point? Did you pick up a deal or? No, it's about a $50 bottle like the old Forester. So that's a pretty much a direct comparison. So I, yeah. think, I think I prefer the old Forester over this one. Sure. So that, but it's it, worth sampling. It's worth sampling. What about you? How's the beer? The beer is good. The beer is done. 6.4% um, alcohol by volume. It, while it's, it's not gumball head, it's not going to replace gumball head. But it is definitely in the same family as far as the taste and flavor notes, the hoppy and wheat to combination, which really it turns out is a really good combo for a beer, at least for a beer I like. So um, West Side Brewing out of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, hoppy wheat, American wheat ale. 
I, I can recommend this one. If you're in the store and you see it, pick it up. I'll have to give it a try. Mike, we're about at the end. Do you have a, have a shout out or two? I do have some shout outs. As usual, up front, I'm going to shout out our podcast financial supporters. Uh, we really appreciate that, guys. I mean, it's really flattering the money that comes in and uh, helps us pay all our hosting and just make that a non-issue so we can just focus on bringing you content. We really appreciate it. And we have two avenues in which you can do that. Uh, you can go to patreon.com and become a uh, patron of Plastic Model Mojo, www.patreon.com slash Plastic Model Mojo, or you can just go to patreon.com and use their search function to find us. Uh, you know, if you go there, you can you can do a, a recurring contribution from a, from a dollar on up, whatever you'd like to do. We really appreciate it. So if you, if you want to do something every month and don't want to be burdened by having to do it yourself, you can get on Patreon and take care of that. Or the other avenue we can do this with is uh, PayPal. And if you go to www.plasticmodelmojo.com, in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see a heart icon. And that takes you directly to our PayPal link to make a direct one-time contribution. Again, it's, it's, it's been great. You've helped us out a lot. You've made this really easy for us to bring you all this content every month. So we, we appreciate the support, encourage you to do so if you want. And, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to echo that. Uh, y'all really have been fantastic. Um, you know, we've been putting out more content, slightly longer content lately, which equates to more hosting fees. And uh, when we started this little venture, you know, it was just we sunk the money into it that, that we needed to do it, uh, mostly Mike, by the way. And it's really nice not to have to worry about what more do we have to sink into it. Uh, it's, it's really nice that so many of you out there are uh, thinking about us and, and enjoy what we do enough to support it. So thank you. And speaking of thinking of us, my shout out is to all of the listeners who reached out when they heard about the tornadoes in Kentucky. I was, I was shocked at how many of the folks in the community reached out just to check in to to find out if Mike and I were okay, if any of this had affected either of us, and luckily it didn't. Kentucky's a fairly large state, so it all happened down on the southern border near Tennessee. So neither of one of us was affected, but it's really nice knowing that so many of you all out there were thinking about us. And when you heard Kentucky, you thought about checking in with us. I, I, I can't tell you how much that, that really means. Well, I will go one further. That area has been devastated. It's been devastated with loss of life and loss of property. What, two weeks before Christmas? Yes. So there's some people down there really hurting. I, if that's on your heart, I mean, there's plenty of legitimate avenues you could donate to causes to, to help those folks down there. And uh, I know my wife and I gathered up a bunch of winter clothing that was in surplus here at the house and some stuff we're going to send to one of the relief agencies who's going door to door and picking up stuff to send down there. Uh, it's a really big, hairy, scary deal. And it's just happening an awful time of year. And, uh, we're fortunate it didn't affect us and that uh, we get to have Christmas with all our, our loved ones next to us. Cause you know, there's people that aren't, aren't with them anymore because of this storm, much less their house or their business or whatever. So if that's, if that's something you might like to do, I look into it and go do it because uh, we're, I'm certainly, we're certainly, this household is, is trying to do what we can uh, to, to, to help somebody out down there because I mean, every little bit helps when they have nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and those, plenty of people just got completely flattened. I mean, uh, you know, even if they they didn't lose loved ones, and plenty of them did, you know, there plenty of people lost everything in their home. So I, I would second that. Encourage you if you're if the heart moves you to do it, find a, find a way to to help them out. Well, my other shout is to BJ at Panzer Concepts. You know, he used to sell these. Sherman tracks and now he's not and they're generally available due to his generosity and sharing. I mean, that's great. 
Yep. Uh, and he's offered me some print suggestions too. And I'm going to have to hit him up again because, uh, the form files he sent me and the printer and resin we're using didn't, didn't quite get there. So, uh, it's a learning process. It's a learning process. And I don't know that much about it really. I mean, I can support the equipment at work, but as far as setting up a print job of this kind of level of detail, which is really in, in excess of what we're doing for the work parts we're making, uh, is a big deal. So BJ, thanks. I appreciate, appreciate the input, appreciate the help. And, uh, I'll keep trucking. I'll get these things resized to the scale I need and, uh, hopefully be able to come up with some, uh, some prints that are, that are good. They're not bad, but, uh, they don't go together quite like you design them to. And I, I'm sure it's the resin and the way I'm doing it. You'll get there. Mike, we've come to the end of an episode. Uh, it's been a, it's been a long one. Hope everybody enjoys it. It has, Dave. It has been a long one, but uh, we got a lot of feedback from our last podcast or our last episode on uh, on adhesives. <laughs> you never yep. know, man. I know. I know. Well, I hope Santa brings you whatever you're looking for. I hope so, man. Yeah. You know what they say, Mike. So many kids. So little time, Dave. Take it easy, man. Take it easy. Stay safe.